All right. Can, it, can everybody hear me all right? All right. Uh, well, it's 11 o'clock. Time to get started. Thank you. Um, for this conversation, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, threat modeling in an agile software development environment. So rather than um, talking about a lot of tools, uh, I want to talk about threat modeling from the perspective of trying to advocate for it within a software development team or a software development organization that has moved from primarily waterfall to agile. Tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I actually have a degree in marketing, so I don't know anything about technology at all. <laughs> Got a degree from uh, Niagara University in marketing and found that I really liked being in technology, and so turned that into a paid hobby a couple years after my degree. Started my own business called ALC Technologies, um, and then folded that into a business with one of my partners um, called ITX Corp. Uh, we're actually headquartered in Rochester, um, and we now are uh, 250 people strong. We have uh, 11 or 12 software development teams uh, and an infrastructure team that helps to manage uh, deployments and security and support for those groups. Um, and I'm kind of the chief geek for that part of the organization. I have a CISSP, pursued my MCSE back in the day. Um, and while I was doing that, I uh, got married and raised a family and got involved with the Boy Scouts. Um, and when I'm not doing technology, I'm reading science fiction uh, or uh, swimming or biking or doing something else that gives me time to listen to audiobooks and podcasts. Um, and finally, I'm always learning. Uh, and you'll see from this conversation, from this talk, one of the things that I've learned is that I'm often wrong. Um, and I'm always trying to find a better way to do what I'm doing. Uh, there's always a way to improve if you look back on how things are going and ask questions and listen to constructive criticism. Um, and so in this, what I want to talk about is my, my journey with our software development teams as the, as the kind of the chief geek, right? As the person who manages these, the infrastructure and manages security, I don't manage any of our developers or any of our development teams. I'm actually not allowed to give orders to our developers or our development teams. Um, I can set standards, um, those standards are approved by the board, and I can audit to those standards to make sure that, that people are following them, but even if they're not following them, right, how do you make sure that every developer is writing good code, right? That's the responsibility of your technical leads and your architects. Um, and so at, at a certain point, software development being a design problem um, and being kind of more of an art form as opposed to being something that's ruled by tools or automation is an interesting problem to solve. And the biggest part of it for us is that our, my job, right, as the head of security is to do my best to make sure that the software that we deliver to our customers isn't putting them on the front page of tomorrow's paper, right? So we want to deliver a good quality product. So years ago when we were talking about software security and trying to get it into our development teams, right, um, we started probably the way a lot of you started, which was doing software development or software security rather as a QA step, right? So um, we do pen testing after the code is delivered to our UAT space. Um, we do vulnerability scanning after the code is delivered to our UAT space. Um, we do automated uh, checks on our code for code quality and that type of thing. Um, and that's not a bad approach, right? But it's um, the, the challenge is that we know by doing it as a QA step that we're going to release software that has bugs in it, right? Um, we can only catch the things that we're able to find during that quality assurance step. Um, and we know that we're not going to catch everything. The other problem is that um, as a software development firm, right, we're building software for our customers. They're paying us for development hours. So when we find a software bug, right, that's what we know a security flaw is, we have to go and fix the software. Or if we find that there's a problem with the code that's not to spec or doesn't meet a particular security standard, we have to go back and fix it. So we're essentially rewriting code and that costs money. And that means that either A, we're eating it, which I'd prefer that we not do because that's our margin. 
uh, or the customers eating it, which they would prefer not to do because they've already paid for it once and they'd rather have us deliver a new feature that's cool and new and exciting for their users. So it's not a win-win for anybody. It's essentially a lose-lose when we have to fix bugs, especially bugs that are related to security. Because the customer obviously expects us to deliver secure code the first time around. But this is the original model. So when I learned about threat modeling, I got really excited, right? Threat modeling is an opportunity for us to think about security from a design perspective, essentially to shift a lot farther left in our software development process than what we're doing now with software um, security testing. And so is everybody here familiar with threat modeling? Not familiar with threat modeling? Uh, just a quick show of hands. So we've got a few, great. Um, I think there's a talk in the afternoon. Um, I'm not sure if the speaker's shown up yet or not, but there's a talk in the afternoon. Somebody's gonna be speaking more deeply about threat modeling. Um, but threat modeling is essentially these four questions, right? We ask these questions, what are we doing, right? What are we building for a software product? And then how can it go wrong, right? So what we're essentially doing is starting to think about what are the problems that can go into or that we might build into the product or how might the product be subverted or how might somebody attack the system and we start asking those questions during um, the design phase. So when architecture delivers an architected product, we can start looking at that product and say, where are our risks points and where are our attack points and where are our potential attack vectors and how will we mitigate it, right? That's our next question is, once we determine that there's a potential attack vector, we can design a mitigation into it, into the product or um, if we don't design mitigation, we can um, implement that code in a different way so that there isn't a threat. Or we can go to the customer and say, there's this potential threat, right? Because when we're designing the product, those threats don't exist yet. They're a potential. The customer might say, I don't care, which is fine too. But then the customer is going into the process with their eyes wide open saying, no, I'm not going to pay for that mitigation or I don't or we might recommend that, well, this isn't a big threat. You might find that your money is better invested someplace else because we're doing an MVP right now. Or it's a threat, but it's not that big of a deal because there's no PII in the system, right? So we can have those conversations with the customer as opposed to the customer just assuming that we're building perfect code. Um, and in that case, we make active choices during the design phase of what we're doing about a potential threat to the system, right? So you might say, um, in our login screen, there's a potential for somebody doing a denial of service attack against the logins themselves or against the login screen so that nobody can access the system, right? So that's what can go wrong. That's our threat vector. And then you can say, well, what we can do about it? There's a couple of things. You, can, uh, you could code the screen so that as it sees more connections from a, an, I, uh, an individual IP, you could start blocking that IP so that they can't access the, that particular login page. Um, that's uh, an active way of coding around it. You could say, we'll mitigate it up front by implementing Cloudflare or some uh, uh, intrusion prevention system in front of it, right? So you could do that. Or you, again, the customer could say, well, I'm not really worried about it because we're deploying this product internally behind a firewall and so there's a really limited level of scope in terms of protecting the login page. So we're just not going to worry about it at all and we'll leave that on the backlog for long term. And then finally there's this question, how did we do in doing something about it, right? And so in this case you can actually, you would actually build a test to see if you actually did it. So, um, so we're able to hand off an active role to the QA team, right? In terms of how do you identify whether or not that we, we built a preventative measure that prevents somebody from DOSing that particular page or that screen in the system, right? So that's essentially what we, what we think about for threat modeling. And, and the cool thing is that threat modeling is kind of a way to think about stuff in general. It's not a it's not a software development model or a security model. This is a way to think about kind of what's the happy path and what does it look like when you deviate from the happy path. Um, I'll give you an example. I have a friend who's 
uh, comes from um, the banking industry, right? And so in the banking industry, in the regulatory space, they do this, but they don't actually know it has a name. It was really interesting. I was talking to him and he's like, yeah, we were, we were seeing that there's this, um, there's a way that somebody can attack this new financial instrument that the banks are asking to allow, have allowed it in the regulatory space. And so we, in order to allow the financial instrument, we kind of have to talk about how that instrument might be subverted, right? So all of a sudden we say, what are we doing? We're creating a new financial instrument, right? What can go wrong? Well, there's a lot of ways people, as we all know from many recessions, um, there's a lot of ways that you can attack a financial instrument or subvert it to make it work for you against the people who are consuming the financial instrument, right? So what can go wrong are all these ways that the financial instrument can be subverted. So then in the regulatory space, what they do is they work with the banks to find checks and balances to prevent that instrument from being subverted. And then finally, how did you do? They have tests that they can go along to see if someone is actively attacking the instrument, right? So in the financial industry, they do it. They just don't call it that. They don't have even a name for it. We're lucky we do now. We call it threat modeling. But we see this in other places too. So even within our software development process, our own team thinks about this not just from, well, how can the system be attacked from a security perspective, but also like, um, like where are the p potential places where the system might have a performance problem, right? Bad performance is also off of the happy path. And so we can identify places where you might have a system bottleneck as opposed to a security threat and then work out mitigations for that and then work out QA steps to determine whether or not you've mitigated that, right? So we can think about threat modeling from a bigger perspective. If we're comfortable with that, we can think about it from a way to just think about how things can go wrong in general and, and um, take a more uh, proactive approach about how we prevent those bad things from happening. Um, if you're interested on the security side, go to the threatmodelingmanifesto.org um, and they actually kind of talk out what threat modeling means, especially for the security organization. So I was really excited, right? We can do threat modeling now. Um, and the way that we started approaching it was by building what's called a data flow diagram. This is something that you can build off of your architectural diagrams or your architectural works. And this is an example data flow diagram from a product called Threat Dragon, which you can get from, for free from um, the OWASP organization. Um, and Threat Dragon is really nice. It lets you build these. And essentially, you've got all your different parts, right? You've got your application and your worker process, right? Those are your systems that process. And then you've got your flows of data so like for instance, an end user using their browser can talk to the application and then there's a web response. And within the model for the data flow diagram, you can identify with the green lines uh, what's called a trust boundary. And that's a space where you identify that data is flowing from a place of lower trust to a place of higher trust or vice versa. Those trust boundaries tend to be an indicator of where your risk points are, where an attacker might attack the system. Um, because at the end of the day, it's either your availability that somebody's attacking or the integrity or the privacy of the data. Usually our customers are a lot more concerned about integrity or privacy than they are necessarily about availability. So we speak to the trust boundaries. This is actually a really good approach. So remember, I'm trying to advocate for better security with our developers. So what we said was, well, let's do this model for each of our development teams on the products that they're working on so we can um, for new products after it comes out of architecture we can start talking about this and for existing products we would go and um, retroactively apply the data flow diagram and then apply threat modeling onto the application and we actually got some, a little bit of traction from this um, we got a couple of unexpected benefits one of the great things was that a lot of our developers didn't actually know how the whole product worked because you've got this development team where you might have a new developer come on, um, you might have developers leave the team, and so you've got some um, natural churn within the team. 
um, sharing a data flow diagram because it kind of parts, parses out how the system is built as an entirety sometimes would bring to light um, how the system worked for new, uh, new developers so it became a training tool for them. Um, the other thing it did was it did start opening up conversations with our clients about potential threats to the system that had not been anticipated. So we started using this um, and it actually was good for us and our customers because we started building out work in our backlogs, um, work that was, could be productive. Um, so um, by doing threat modeling, what we did was we essentially inserted a new step for quality and it was shifted left, right? So we've got architecture and the, the, the UX design and we've got our feature ideation that occurs at the beginning of the product development we do our threat modeling, everything's really exciting. We start building out our backlog of security related work that needs to be done for the application. And then in theory, you've got your build work. Um, and then you've got the rest of your testing and QA, right? And then your final release, right? The problem is that this is the waterfall model. So in the room here, who's still doing waterfall for their product development? If you're doing what product development? Right, who's doing agile if you're doing project development? Right, so all of you guys are like, that's not how it works, <laughs> right? Um, agile is more iterative, right? Um, and in the case of your design, you do have your initial design, but the design is more short term looking towards your initial MVP rather than a finished product because agile obviously implies that we don't have necessarily a finished product or we definitely don't have one right away. Right, and so in the middle between your deployments, um, you've got change happening all of the time. And so this is kind of what I learned is there's a breakdown here, right? We do our initial architecture and design and we do all of our work for threat modeling and then we go away. And then all of a sudden you've got a whole mess of change that's occurring and no way to account for new threats that might be occurring within the system because you're enhancing your system. Um, and so you've still got your QA for your security testing, your automated stuff, but the, the QA team also is unaware of new threats that might be indicated that ought to be getting tested for, right? So other than exploratory testing, which our QA people still can do, your QA people are prevented from doing testing against new user stories that are being created in the system. So, uh, so we're kind of halfway there, right? We have a data flow diagram that might or might not be up to date. And we have uh, a product that has some threats mitigated, anticipated, and we're mitigating other threats by doing QA at the very end of the process before release. But we've got a lot of churn in the product and the product is um, slowly drifting away from our initial development. So realistically, this is kind of what we have for our timeline, right? Um, we have our engagement and then we have a cycle of sprints um, and then uh, our final release. Um, and unfortunately, this is, this is kind of a huge breakdown for us in the traditional model of threat modeling, right? Because oftentimes you may not even have architecture re-architecting the system. You definitely don't have your team lead bringing in security on every sprint. Um, for us, it's because the customer is not paying for that extra FTE worth of time to monitor what's going on in security, right? Um, and for you guys, budget is a thing too. If you have multiple de development teams, security may be sitting in an advisory capacity, but they're definitely not embedded in the team like your developers and your QA people are. So things might be um, getting overlooked or um, uh, or not thought of because your team is actually churning out new features as they're being ideated with the customer. But Agile is valuable. It works, right? Um, and we're not going to be able to stop people from doing Agile just because we don't like the way that they're managing security, right? So a realistic timeline for our Agile would be um, to do uh, so we have our um, our sprints and our intermittent releases between our sprints 
ideally we should be revisiting our threat model periodically within our sprints to take an account for new features and new changes. This was kind of our interim solution. What we came up with was, okay, well, why don't we re-threat model every quarter or every couple of sprints to account for new features that are released, right? Um, so that maybe we can get new stuff into the backlog. Um, and again, we're, we're developing towards something that's better, but it's still not perfect. Um, we found that this was still helpful because we were identifying new threats and we were able to have those conversations with our customers. Um, but what we found also was that um, a couple of things. One is you can see if we're threat modeling every like three or five sprints, we're having multiple releases that potentially have security flaws in those releases or new threats being added to the product. It's still not real time. And if you're if you're catching it that far out, then you're already past the development process. And again, remember, threat modeling is supposed to be a design process. Right? Just the, the same way you bring a UX person in to design what the look and feel of the system is, we want to be thinking, like, where's our system going to break? Right? That's how threat modeling works. What are we building? How can it go wrong? We should be asking that question during that step. Right? Again. New features are being added in every single sprint. Um, and we should be accounting for that every single sprint. So while adding intermittent threat modeling was helpful, and it was helping us because we were getting the extra revenue from the extra items in our backlog, I won't say that it wasn't good. It wasn't great because, again, it's not a win-win. Right? The customer's essentially getting a delayed reaction. Um, and so we said, well, the problem is that we can't have constant oversight uh, in our agile team and um, because we don't have a security person assigned to every team. So we said, what if we were to add some extra training to our team members themselves, right? So we came up with this idea. We call them security champions, right? So this is going to be awesome. What we did was we said, okay, well, we're going to have somebody embedded in every team who might be a developer, who might be a QA person. We don't care. We want somebody who's kind of more interested in security than the rest of their teammates. So we asked for volunteers, and we got volunteers. Some teams, we had two people who volunteered. I think our, our developers, just as much as anybody else, know that security is important. And they were actually engaged. Like, I wanted to learn more about software security. So we did do extra training. Um, we said. Every team needs at least one security champion. That was a, kind of something that we asked for. Or if the team didn't have a security champion, we said, um, uh, when, um, we said we'd like to at least have builds reviewed by somebody who's a security champion. And the question we said was, well, we want you to assist in identifying security issues. Um, we did do uh, pretty aggressive training. Uh, we trained them all on OWASP top 10 and the OWASP proactive controls, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, the secure product lifecycle uh, is something that was um, that we actually asked everybody to review, including our team managers and our technical leads. Uh, but we found a couple of other really good resources. We essentially said, let's train our developers who are doing this as pen testers. Um, and so Troy Hunt has a really good course uh, called Hack Yourself First. Um, and we ran them through that. And there's also a good resource called hacksplaining.com. Um, and there's either a free or a paid resource. It's paid if you're doing the enterprise version where you can get reporting into your central system. But the hacksplaining is a really good resource too. It kind of works them through like, here's all the different types of hacks. And it shows how to mitigate against those hacks as well as how to execute them. So they, they worked through that. And then we did a capture the flag, which was really fun as part of our training. The problem was that we had security champions in place. Um, and then when we went back and measured, there weren't any actual new um, stories being added that were related to security. So now we've got security champions in every team, but no threats being identified to the system, which we thought was weird. Um, and we went back and actually sat in on a bunch of um, a bunch of stand-ups for our agile teams. 
And what we were finding was um, nobody was um, nobody was talking about security in our standups. So the um, the team manager or the we call them the product owners, right? The innovation leads in our case. We're talking through designing the new feature. Um, the developers were there participating in the standup, but we were definitely not having them participate from their security perspective. They had their developer hats back on, and they were participating as developers. Right. So, <clears throat> so again, within our our agile process, we've got this iteration where um, we design. So we're grooming our backlog. We're bringing stories in. Usually, the product owner or the customer representative is saying we want to do this, we want to do this. We refine those stories and we release the stories, right? That's during the design phase. Um, and again, this is where we had expected that we would start seeing threats either go into design and flag them as threats or new stories being written in our backlog for review with the client. We weren't seeing anything like that at all. So, um, so the next thing we said was, well, let's intentionally add security champions into our refinement process. Um, <clears throat> has anybody read the checklist manifesto? OK. Um, well, there's this uh, guy named uh, Atul Gawande. He wrote the checklist manifesto. Somebody? Yeah. <clears throat> and um, they wrote. Um, he wrote from his experience in the healthcare field. He worked for the um, the global, what is it, the, the World Health Organization, the WHO. And one of the challenges that the WHO had about improving the health of the world global community is that a lot of the global community has different amounts of financial resources for implementing change. And the book Checklist Manifesto reflected on some of the things that he learned about checklisting and the use of a checklist for delivering improved health in the global community. Um, essentially, one of the things they did was they, they built a, a real checklist that everybody now uses generally for pre-surgery um, conditions. It was kind of based on checklists that airline pilots use for when they're doing, um, when you're starting up a plane and getting ready to, to taxi out. Um, and one of the steps in that checklist was that each of the people would declare their role in the surgery. So they'd say, you know, I'm Paul whatever, I'm the head surgeon, and, um, and somebody else would say, well, I'm Raul, I'm the, the lead nurse, or whatever, and everybody would declare their role. Part of it was to get over um, some hurdles they saw within the organization where in surgery some people were afraid um, because it was oftentimes depersonalized, they were afraid to, to make a comment during that process. They wouldn't, they wouldn't say, uh, doctor, there's a problem, like you forgot the sponge, or whatever. They would, they would step back because they didn't have a good relationship or a personal relationship. The other part was that um, the doctors oftentimes didn't recognize, or the surgeons didn't recognize the people in the team as individuals either. So they wanted to increase kind of the communication and respect and we wanted to do the same thing. So at the beginning of the refinement, we actually are asking people, you know, if you sp play a special role, we want you to say out loud, I'm the security champion, or I'm the performance champion, I'm the QA champion. And so they shift from wearing the hat of a developer to wearing the hat of security during that refinement. And so there's an onus that they take on, essentially, to be more responsible for that particular problem or that particular role during that that refinement session, and um, and so that was the first thing we found was in the refinement session when people would actively declare that they had a special role, they would be more um, more actually active in the process. So instead of sitting back and just saying, "Well, there's a technical feasibility problem," which is usually why your developers are in your refinement is they'll say, well, I can't do that, or I'm having a problem with this, or whatever. Um, now we've got developers or a QA person who are saying there's a security problem here because of X, Y, or Z, right? So we're actually seeing more active security roles um, as opposed to be, you know, more passive about it. 
Um, the other thing we did was we asked them to modify how we were doing the story writing themselves. So normally you write what's called a user story. And within the user story, you say this is what's being done. Um, these are the expected outcomes, right? So um, essentially you're, you're writing out the algorithm of the story um, in story form. So when user X does action Y, um, result Z occurs. And you also might say um, these are the limits or boundaries for the QA team, right? So this is, they'll, they'll describe how you test it to make sure it works. So what we said was let's add abuser stories. Um, we've got some people who are sensitive, so we, if you've got people who are sensitive to language, you might want to use the word like a misuser story as opposed to abuser story, um, which is fine. The cool thing is it still rhymes with user stories. So you've got your user stories and your misuser stories. And in this case, you're starting to parallel the steps and threat modeling within the confines of refining a single story. So you say, what are we doing, right? That's your intended algorithm. And then your misuser stories, right? So how can that be subverted to break it? And this is, these are our different threats or attack factors to this, this story. In some cases, there is no abuser story, right? Sometimes you have a very simple algorithm feature or function that you're writing. In other times, you might find multiple abuser stories. So you might have um, you know, a security attack threat. You might have an opportunity for a performance problem. Say you're designing a new report a structure. Um, you might have an opportunity for a normal user to misuse the system, which is why we use sometimes misuser as opposed to abuser. So for instance, um, if you can select and delete multiple records from a filter, somebody might in theory select everything, right? And you want to identify that that's a potential flaw in the way that you're designing the system, which could allow somebody to delete all of your data, even though they're authorized to do it. You might not necessarily want that outcome, right? So when you essentially at this point, you're saying, how can we stray from the happy path, right? And this is kind of what we're teaching now is, how can we stray from the happy path and how can we prevent that from occurring in a way that's graceful, right? So that's where you start talking about mitigations, right? What can we do about that? So UX might get in, be getting involved with internal user um, potential flaws, right? So you can have UX design a, um, a, a pop-up that says, hey, guess what? You're about to delete all of our records or 10, you know, thousand records. Is this what you meant? Um, UX can also do things like uh, if you're running the person through a sequence of screens, you definitely don't want your final accept button to be in the same place as where your next button is because somebody might just keep clicking, right? Um, it happens and we need to design for that, right? That's off of the happy path again. So you kind of talk through the mitigations or again, uh, if the product is owner is there, you might have that conversation, well, this is a, a low risk event. So even though it's a potential threat, you can still have that conversation of, well, we're not gonna worry about it. We'll just call it out to the customer and let, you know, and let them have the opportunity to override our decision. But maybe we're just not gonna do anything at all, right? That's okay too. Um, again, from us, I've always had this weird uh, quandary, right, which is that I'm the security guy, but I don't get to boss anybody around. <laughs> um, especially when we're doing work for our customers, right? Our customers ultimately are the arbiters of their own risk. The, the problem that we have, and this is why I've been really struggling to move our company towards moving security into the design phase. The problem is that we, if we don't tell our customer what risks exist, then we own it, right? And if the development team builds something without declaring that there's a threat that they've identified, right? Negligence probably isn't the right word, <laughs> but essentially the development team is accepting the risk and carrying that risk instead of the customer accepting and carrying the risk. And so when you get to the delivery point and you deliver a broken product, if you knew that there was a problem and you didn't tell the customer, then essentially you're accepting the risk of a negative outcome if you deliver a broken product where you have that outcome, right? So from, from me moving from having my 
my security hat to me having my management hat, right? Um, I don't want to be in a position where I have to explain to a customer why there's something wrong with their product. I would much rather say, well, this was a threat that we identified for you six months ago, sir. And you said you didn't want to make an investment in mitigating that threat at that time. Here's the documentation for when we had that conversation. We can fix it for you now, but you own the outcome, right? You're responsible for what happened. That's a great conversation to have. Maybe not for our customer, but it's a great, it's a great position to be in with the product owner, right? Because um, it, it prevents you from having to take on that, that liability. All right, so as a as a as a contractor role in that contractor role or in a, a delivery role, it's nice to be able to offset and identify who really ought to own that risk and make sure that they carry it. So um, finally, with the abuser stories or the misuser stories, the last is within the story you can actually write out specific tests against that particular threat or those particular threats that were designed. So we're able to catch that during the testing and acceptance for that one story as opposed to having to do it when you're doing, say, exploratory testing or vulnerability testing after it's in the UAT space, the user acceptance space. So it gives you a little bit more granularity in terms of testing for the security um, and allowing your QA people to do a good job. Or in some cases, you can automate those tests if your developers are building uh, automated uh, testing. Right, so <clears throat> suddenly now, we're essentially threat modeling everywhere, right? This is kind of the, the outcome that we want, is we do want to be doing the threat modeling up front when we have our initial design, but we also want to be threat modeling at each step, and we want to be threat modeling within each sprint, because as a feature is added, right, as we talked about before, that's when you can do the best job designing a secure product, not identifying it after the fact, hopefully, and going back and rewriting your code, but actually writing good code at the beginning. And again, this is, this is the other side of the story with a relationship with a customer is the better quality code you can deliver from the very beginning, the better the outcome is for us, but also for our customer because that maximizes their outcome, right? It, if I'm a steward of our client's um, money or financial investment, I, the more that I can do to reduce the cost to, to fixing bugs and means, that, um, means that that customer gets to have more features or they get to have a better visual design because they can afford more money for those other things as opposed to fixing bugs, right? And that's, again, what we consider security things. So, um, that's what I've got. Uh, are there any questions or comments or thoughts? Yes. Um, in regards to security champions, I just had a question in regards to how you pay first found security champions or how you made the developers excited about security. And then second, how do you actually retain that excitement? So if you have an initial phase of you'll be the security champion and then maybe some things go by, how do you make sure that they're still following along? Kind of lowering that value. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for those of you who didn't hear, he's saying um, once we had identified our security champions, how do we keep the security champions excited about security, right? Is that, yeah, essentially. So um, it's a couple things. First was um, it's a voluntary role, right? So, um, so the first thing we're doing is trying to identify people who already think security is an interesting part of their work. Um, and then the next step was that uh, we, we had a, we do it like an annual or a biannual training. So, <clears throat> um, so we made sure that they went through the training and we actually did a, like a capture the flag exercise where there was some com competition um, and that encouraged the learning. Um, we used the, uh, OWASP has a, a shopping cart system. Juice. Yeah, the juice system. And the cool thing about that is it's intentionally vulnerable to like all of these different vulnerabilities. And so as they're competing to find the vulnerabilities, they're actually learning how they're executed and how to remediate them at the same time. So we did the, the competition with Ju Juicebox. So that was the next step. So um, 
other than that, we had two other things that we've done. One is that um, part of the role as being a security champion is to identify the next security champion um, so that uh, they can participate in not only training them, but um, also getting them excited right, about it. So at least they're acting like they're still excited. <laughs> Um, the second thing we did was we actually started um, like a, a monthly, it's not a lunch and learn because everybody has lunch at different times now, um, but kind of a monthly get together where people kind of um, will demo something that they found or that they fixed or that they identified that was a, a remediation. Um, and then the third part was uh, we made uh, not just security champions, but this concept of a champion role we rolled it into how people are able to advocate for their own uh, advancement. So um, we have uh, developer level one, developer level two, developer level three. And one of the things we did was we said to move from one to two, um, you need to take on one or more champion roles. And if you abandon a champion role, the potential is that you could slide back to from three to two or two to one if you don't maintain those roles. Um, the last thing we're thinking about doing, but I haven't brought to the head developer yet, is um, a CPEs or continuing professional education credits. Um, it's worked for me in terms of keeping me actively learning by actually tracking CPE work. Um, and the response I got from our uh, from the head of delivery right now is, "We're too busy to talk about that." <laughs> So I'm hoping maybe in 2023 that's um, adding CPEs as a rigorous way to measure that people are maintaining their champion role is, is something that we can add in um, because it keeps them in, involved in learning new stuff about their industry. So thanks for the question. Yes. Okay, so your question was, how were we measuring whether or not people were uh, adding security as a concern into the stories that were being written? Um, and so the Scrum Master, one of the roles they do is they tag stories in JIRA as they're delivering them. So if there's anything that's an abuser story or security related, um, they're actually tagging the story with security um, as part of um, building that issue or, or building it for release. So we're able to do a, a quick measure over time in terms of how many stories are being created that had the security concerns added to it. Does that answer your question? That's also, I don't know if you've covered views. I wonder if you saw any increase in security concerns in the covered views. Like, looking at it, it's like, oh, this is a concern. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I'm not measuring for that because it didn't occur to me. <laughs> And that sounds like an awesome addition. I should talk to our develop or our director of architecture on that because the technical leads report to director of architecture and they do the code reviews for their teams. Thank you. I'm actually going to capture that. That's a great idea. What do you mean? Um, so the White House Commission Punch Result, but like they're requiring that any governments that purchase software, they confirm and verify that it's following the NIST SSDF. Gotcha. So software development right? Yep, yep. So are you are, are you already doing that or are you having clients now like asking you to pay and use it? Um that's interesting. So first we don't do a lot of work with the government. Um right. because <laughs> I've always felt like the winner to a bid was the loser, right? So <laughs> we've always. It's not, it's not I mean, government uses the same software that any enterprise Yeah, right? yeah. So I think it's going to have a huge kind of, um, yeah, supply chain. Yeah. So um, we haven't looked at NIST, at aligning our s policies to the NIST policies yet in terms of um, one at a time. Historically, um, we've been when or we've had that yeah okay. that particular framework so historically a lot of our work has been business to business e-commerce driven mm -hmm. um so we've been aligning more of our stuff to like the pci framework okay. which is um a little bit more prescriptive so it's a lot easier to deal with 
in terms of checking the boxes. Or alternatively, we've got a couple of clients that have their own framework in, um, in an outline of requirements that we have to meet. Yeah. And so we've been working against that as well. Okay. Um, going against NIST per se, that's on our uh, backlog for our own cer certification stuff. So right now we're working on, um, oh, what the heck is it called? Um, I just blanked out. Uh, it'll come to me. But um, adding NIST into our uh, compliance controls is probably for us going to be 2024 or 2025 in terms of our maturity level. It really depends. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point is this concept of trickle down. I'll give you an example. This year, a boatload of our customers just got excited about accessibility, right? Does anybody know why? Because of all the lawsuits, right? So, yeah, once you see that kind of come through the court system, that can drive the compliance requirements into, into that trickle town, right? So now, see what, what we run as a challenge is we've got customers who may not have the sophistication to think about that. So they're paying for features and they assume the rest, right? Um, and so with this trickle down effect, one thing that it does is it, it allows us, it forces us oftentimes to have that communication up front with the customer saying, ADA compliance is probably something you want to pay for now <laughs> because you probably need to have it. And once we can have that conversation about getting it funded where the customer knows that they need to pay for it, then we'll get it in and, and we already have the way to apply those controls as we're doing the development. Like you said, you're having to continuously train your staff to keep them up to date on what's happening yeah. right before you know, world because you have to start talking about that. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, and sometimes, uh, again, for anybody who's doing outward facing work, sometimes a lot of the, we call them non-functional requirements, right? A lot of those, the customer even either thinks they're getting for free, because <laughs> they're supposed to, um, or uh, they don't want to pay for them because they have a limited budget, right? Um, so a, a good example is like a really small customer who might only have like a twenty-five dollars or $30,000 budget isn't going to have the money in that small of a scope to also be ADA compliant. So at that point, you're, you're just going to be like, well, we'll apply one of these seven templates in a WordPress site because all of that is kind of cheap. Um, and you'll get the benefit of, of using these compliant components instead. So when we get down to that space, it's done for us and we don't really have to have a conversation with, about it. At the high end, you see that's where you see a lot more intentionality about talking about security and performance and stuff like that and those are customers that oftentimes have the sophistication to actually call it out as a requirement already that middle space is where it's a real challenge right so any other questions or yes again this one yeah, so this comes out of Threat Dragon, which is an open source tool for threat modeling. It generates a JSON file. And actually, this is really cool. Um, one of the things you can do, right, is like on this point here, right, where the um, data flows, oh, sorry, this point here, where the data flows across a threat boundary you can actually identify a threat within the application that you want to have mitigated, call out um, within the framework what mitigation, how the mitigation falls, and it'll actually store that as either mitigated or unmitigated. So the cool thing that we did was we actually built a little program that reads that JSON file and automatically submits those as new issues into our JIRA backlog for that particular product. So we didn't have to worry about transcriptioning because that's a, oftentimes either forgets to happen or there's a transcription delay. So, um, and then when they do get mitigated, it pulls it back down from the closed issue back into the model so that people can actually see how many unmitigated things are in the model. 
So that was really a success for us just by being able to process that JFON, JSON file. Um, and we store the JSON file in Git. So we've got the version control in it as well. Any other comments? Awesome. Well, again, um, uh, I'll throw my contact information up there if you guys have any questions. Um, if you're interested in that, that uh, JSON reader for JIRA, by the way, that is open source. So, you know, if anybody is interested in it, just pop me an email. It's, you'll have to do a little bit of work just to adjust it for your, your own API keys and stuff. But other than that, um, we don't have any problems releasing it. Um, and other than that, thank you so much for giving me your attention. And uh, I'll be here around for much of the rest of the day.